people. Um, I've, I've been working for Save the Sound for almost five years, and I've been working on the Plum Island uh, campaign for 10 years. Wow, okay. Yes, and it's been, it, it's been a long and difficult campaign. Um, you know, lots of political influence, lots of um, le federal legislation, which finally got passed a, a couple of years ago. Um, Louise has a history of working in the environment. She worked for the state DEC for a number of years before she moved on um, into the NGO realm. Um, so I will turn the meeting over to Louise and she will talk to us about Plum Island. And we'll save our, you can type questions into the chat and we'll try to answer them or you can save them till the end and we will try to answer questions at that point. Louise? Okay, thank you very much. Let me share my, uh, get my PowerPoint going. So if, um, first of all, uh, if you want to see all of this artwork, you can um, reduce uh, the gallery view and put it over somewhere in the corner. Um, so yes, I'm Louise Harrison. I'm the New York Natural Areas Coordinator for Save the Sound. And I have been working on the Plum Island campaign now for quite some time. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is tell you some facts about Plum Island, tell you about the campaign to save Plum Island and bring you up to date on where we are today. And um, I have a lot of slides and what I will, I will be going rapidly through some of them uh, to keep up with the time frame, uh, but happy to go back to any that you want me to linger on. And I'm also going to um, emphasize some of the natural history attributes of Plum Island, even though uh, it has a long and rich history and there are historical uh, sites there um, and a historic district. Um, you'll see some of that, but I am, because this is Audubon Society, I am gonna be emphasizing the natural areas and the natural history. Before I move off from this slide, I wanna give credit to artist Scott Bluedorn from East Hampton, um, and you will see other artwork in this, uh, all done by Scott, and uh, we, in particular, we love uh, this illustration. It's kind of evocative of that um, Native American idea of, of land rising on the back of a turtle, but of course we know Plum Island for its seals. So if you're not familiar with Plum Island, we'll zoom in on it here. It's, it's off the east end of the North Fork and right about a mile and a half off of Orient Point. And I'll be taking you to various places here, a bit of a virtual tour. Um, this stripy area here is a 96 acre freshwater wetland. Um, that's rather unusual. I'll be showing you lots of different places as we move along. Um, another view, um, just to, for comparison purposes, Central Park is about the same size as Plum Island. Plum Island's not huge. Uh, it's only 840 acres, but look how many plant species, 444 plant species have been seen there. A majority of them are native um, and the, the preponderance of, of native and interesting plants and animals on Plum Island is a real source of, of fascination. The New York Natural Heritage Program actually uh, went a step further than that and did quite a bit of work to determine what are the ecological communities and what species are on Plum Island. And in uh, 2012, they did a literature search. And then in 2016, they were able to go to Plum Island uh, over the course of four seasons with a variety of scientists and um, figure out in, in short periods of time that they had there uh, what they could about the island. And um, they found 25 different ecological communities on the 840 so acres. Um, five of them considered significant, including uh, maritime bluffs. And you recognize those little holes at the top, I'm quite sure, as the home of bank swallows. Um, they 
consider the maritime uh, dunes and maritime beaches there to be significant. Um, the marine rocky tidal inter, the, the marine rocky intertidal zone. Um, here's one of their scientists doing an inventory, biological inventory. Um, marine eelgrass beds. And here's another view of that beautiful freshwater wetland there it's, uh, that I pointed out was 96 acres in size. They did not spend as much time as they would have liked there. Um, there's an awful lot there to see, but it's certainly something we should be studying more if we can. They've been keeping track of the bird species that have been sighted at or from Plum Island and now up to 228 of them. Um, the numbers below might not be up to date. Uh, there might be more than 57 uh, at-risk species there at this point, or 60, more than 63 be breeders. Um, but those numbers were true when they found um, about 196 bird species. So I'm assuming some of those numbers have increased. And, and uh, I'll try to go through these. I'm sure you know them, the, um, the Northern Harrier, the American Black Duck, American Eider. Um, let's see, we have uh, American Bittern, uh, American Oyster Catcher. Uh, let's see, Roseate Tern, um, Piping Plover and uh, Common Tern, unless I have my turns backwards. And if I do, you'll, you can tell me that. Um, and many rare plant species there. Again, they'd like to get back and do more work to determine what species are there. But one in particular, um, the spring ladies tresses was found in really large numbers there in 2012, um, or maybe slightly before, um, in an area that had been part of the historic Fort Terry in a, marine, in a parade ground where soldiers used to do their exercises and drills. Um, when they went back in 2016, they found fewer. And they think that with proper management, that population can increase again. Um, at the time, uh, it was a large population. It was the largest in New York State. And the seals are what many people know of, uh, about Plum Island. Um, on a winter's day, you might see as many as, as three, four hundred of them up on the rocks on the south side of the island. Uh, one particular winter's day, they found as many as 600 seals there, mostly harbor seals hauling up on the rocks. So it's considered the largest seal haul out area in New York State and one of the largest in southern New England. Um, sea turtles are known to be around Plum Island. Byron said he saw a green turtle off Orient Point years ago. Um, the uh, people preparing an environmental impact statement for uh, the federal government on Plum Island um, included the leatherback you see here. Um, I think there, there are at least four of the sea turtles we know of uh, for New York are here. Um, and we're starting to explore the underwater lands around Plum Island, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, but here's a, an example of one of the uh, marine, di the marine scientific divers uh, that Save the Sound has supported through a very generous donor to go and um, characterize the bottom lands around Plum Island. You know, don't, don't think of an island as ending at the shoreline, of course, it extends down under the water and uh, this habitat is highly interesting. Um, this uh, diver had tried to get there for 30 years and when he was there, he was amazed at things like uh, this sea anemone and um, bryozoans, uh, marine worms, <clears throat> Uh, sponges galore, kelp, all encrusting these giant glacial boulders that are um, around the island, mostly on the north side. Um, he says that everything that was not, um, everything that was a hard surface was covered with marine life. There wasn't a single inch of bare space anywhere. 
They're clean, highly oxygenated waters around Plum Island. And of course, this attracts fish and the fish attract birds. And it's, it's just an amazing biodiversity from top to bottom. You can, you can look at this report from the first year um, at that website, which I have over there on the left. Uh, it's also on um, the Preserve Plum Island website, which you'll get later, preserveplumisland.org. You can get a copy of it there. We're sending divers again uh, the first week in August, and they're going to do uh, continued work on biodiversity. So Plum Island is also known for its history, has an historic lighthouse. Uh, this one built in um, 1869 was the second one. The first one uh, back in, I think, 1824 was finally built by the federal government after over 100 shipwrecks took place in Plum Gut, uh, which is a very dangerous, high, uh, na navigable but treacherous waterway between Orient Point and Plum Island. Um, that lighthouse must have been wooden. It didn't last very long. This one um, is, is still there. You can see it has some rust and some problems. And uh, we're hoping that that can be upgraded, or at least um, maintained. And a view of historic Fort Terry, which um, was built at the time of the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War never came here, but it spurred on a whole bunch of building of coastal defenses um, to basically to protect New York Harbor. And Long Island Sound being an entryway into New York City um, saw the development of, of numerous forts, Fort Wright um, on Fisher's Island, um, Fort Mikey on Great Gull Island, Fort Terry here on Plum Island, um, and others. Um, you, the view you're seeing here is to the west. So past that water tower is Orient Point. This was taken last fall. And what most people have heard about with regard to Plum Island, of course, is the Animal Disease Center. And it's still functioning right now even though it's scheduled to move on to Manhattan, Kansas, where they've built uh, a new facility. The Plum Island Animal Disease Center is known around the world now for its top level research on foot and mouth disease. It's the only place in the world where this research has taken place. And they've actually developed a, disease, a, a vaccine for it there, uh, which makes this site rather historic. Um, veterinarians come in from all around the world to pick up vials of the vaccine and bring it back to their homelands and receive training here. But now there's going to be a new facility in Manhattan, Kansas, that will be of a higher biosafety level. And at that new facility, they will be also studying diseases that can be transmitted from animals to people. You've heard of Zika virus, and now we, you know, there's some concern that coronavirus uh, or the SARS virus that we've been dealing with um, came from animals. So th this, does, this disease laboratory on Plum Island does not um, study those kinds of diseases. These are strictly diseases that go from animal to animal. And foot and mouth disease is considered one of the, mo if not the most contagious disease known. Uh, an infected animal just being outdoors and breathing on Plum Island could infect cattle in Connecticut because it's transmitted through the air column. But the fact that this is moving to Kansas um, brought about a piece of legislation in Congress in 2008, and they updated it in 2012 that actually put this amazing island on the auction block. And this is where the campaign to save Plum Island began because people recognized that Plum Island had incredible natural, cultural, and historic resources and that it should not be sold to the highest bidder. Normally, public lands you know, that are already publicly owned would be transferred to another agency that would like to have them not sold to the highest bidder, which would put it in the hands of developers. So this launched 
the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. And Eastern Long Island Audubon Society is a member, thank you. Um, this coalition started to form around 2010, 2011. Um, the only requirement for membership is to agree with the, the mission of the coalition, which is to make sure that Plum Island is uh, conserved, that it, it finds some way uh, into preservation for its um, resources, hopefully a wildlife refuge, but if not a wildlife refuge, in some other type of conservation. And now we have actually more than 117 organizations that are members. Some of these are very large national organizations. So the, you know, for person to person, there's many, many, many people. At one time, um, someone calculated there might be between three and six million actual individuals when you count up the membership of those organizations. And we went to Washington to say, uh, you know, please reverse this. We, we don't think Plum Island should be sold to the highest bidder. We went there a couple of times. Uh, we were in touch with our legislators all along, but when we took a trip there, we met with, um, this was a 20, uh, 2018 trip, I believe, this picture. And we met with some people who were um, in the Environment and Public Works Committee. And they said, well, it's all well and good that you, you, know, you think Plum Island should be preserved, but um, we really need more detail than that. And we said, well, the town of Southhold thinks it should be in conservation and it should be um, some continued research should take place there. And they said, well, that's all interesting, but that's not a plan. And, and we need to know more about what you have in mind. So this is uh, the beginning of a process that we started called Envision Plum Island. The Nature Conservancy and Save the Sound got together. And again, with some donor money, we were able to hire uh, a group called Marstel Day that guided us through um, a process of workshops and many, many individual meetings um, with people in all sectors. Um, some were elected officials, some were government workers, uh, nonprofit groups in environment and history, uh, Long Island Native Americans, people from Connecticut, um, people from uh, you know, local communities. Um, and, and we moved into a series of meetings, raised questions, and then as we had questions and began answering them, it bring in more questions. So it was an iterative process, and um, we were really banging heads together uh, to try to find out what did the region really want for the future of Plum Island. And if you stare at the faces here, you'll recognize some people um, that you, you may know. Um, you may know Bob DeLuca. Um, here's uh, Matt Schlesinger from New York Natural Heritage Program. S um, Scott Russell, the supervisor of the town of Southhold. Mark Woolley who works for Congressman Zeldin. Um, let's see who else. Aaron Virgin, who worked for the group for the East End. Um, Ruth Ann Bramson, who wrote a great book about uh, the history of Plum Island called A World Unto Itself, The Remarkable History of Plum Island, New York. Oh, Mel, um, Mel Morris from uh, Brookhaven National Lab is here too. <laughs> and then we um, had an, a meeting at Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, during the New York, um, the Long Island Natural History Conference, which many of you might attend on an annual basis. And, uh, but we, we only had an hour and 20 minutes to meet with the sci scientists and naturalists who go to that conference. We did it during a lunch hour. <clears throat> so we gave them these documents ahead of time and asked them to please look at them, um, familiarize themselves with what they could about Plum Island, what was already known, and then come and help us answer some questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so we had this whirlwind, uh, session answering uh, five main questions in groups at tables and then print, you know, we had these uh, reporting out sessions, uh, table to table, we had 10 tables, about 60 people. And we got a lot of really, really good information and thoughts 
um, from people on this. So you, you may recognize Carl Safina here um, and, and, and others. Oh, Pat Aiken, you may know, she's a great birder. Here's Artie Kopelman from uh, Cressley, Coastal, Resource, Coastal Research and Education Society of Long Island. So um, I wanted you to know that we relied heavily on a zoning that was already uh, put in place in 2013 by the town of Southhold. When, when Southhold found out that Plum Island was for sale, they felt that it was time for them to show a little bit of uh, what they wanted for the future of Plum Island. And because it had been and still is now federally owned, uh, local zoning doesn't apply, but they went through the process of creating zoning for the island that would go into place uh, at the moment it became privately owned. If Plum Island were sold to the highest bidder, they wanted people to know, hey, this green area here, this is all for conservation. This lavender area here, that's for research. And that's the way we like it here in, on, in Southhold. So they made a big deal about it and um, we supported it. And we use this in our work at all the workshops as a basis, sort of a platform for our thinking. Um, some, some of the key recommendations that came out um, agreed with the refuge idea. Uh, there was some agreement that habitat restoration was needed in certain areas, um, that any kind of use of Plum Island had to be done in a delicate manner with elevated walkways and patrols. Um, there should be signage for interpretation as well as for uh, cautions. Um, the idea was to limit access uh, in some way and um, that people agreed that research and education should be the priorities there. <coughs> Excuse me. Knowing that um, there was amazing historic resources there as well, uh, there was some concern and a lot of discussion about how to blend visitation because a lot of people really like to go to lighthouses and forts um, with wildlife conservation and um, as well as some kind of celebration of uh, Native American cultural heritage and research on that. So there was some discussion on how uh, these, these historic resources uh, could be worked into conservation planning. Um, of course, everybody wanted to protect seals and shorebirds and bluffs. Uh, everyone agreed there shouldn't be any uh, boats allowed to pull up on, this, on the beaches there. And we developed uh, a report. Uh, this one on the right here, the full report, Envision Plum Island, a Connecting Landscape of History, Nature and Research. It's about 72 pages long with lots of detailed recommendations in it based on the workshops and the interviews and the research that we did. Um, that's available on this website, as you see at the top here. I can repeat it again later if you wanna look at it. <coughs> we also thought we should have an easy uh, way to sort of get the concepts. And so we created a brochure, which is a pictorial synopsis of our ideas. So there's a lot of artwork in the brochure and the concept is if somebody turns the pages, they will get through the pictures, uh, the vision that we have for Plum Island, also available at that website. And basically this is the concept, which I'll go over with you. You saw the zoning map for Plum Island that uh, Southhold created. We, we use that as a template and yet we added a few more areas. So we took the conservation district, which was this whole area here, and we broke it up into three zones. And we took the research district here and we broke it up into two zones. So for the research district, we noticed that this is where the lighthouse is. And um, the lighthouse might have visitation. So uh, we thought that should have its own little section and its own treatment. Um, the research district, which the town envisioned as bringing in some kind of new biotechnology work or something else, um, might need 
a campus and uh, might need space for that. And maybe the people visiting the lighthouse wouldn't be good to mingling with workers um, while they're doing their work here in the research district. So that we just sectioned that off. By the way, this gray area here is the harbor. <clears throat> so the conservation district, the three zones we chose um, were for different types of use. We saw this central area where Fort Terry is as having some more durability, you might say, uh, on a landscape basis. It's already been heavily developed. Um, it has this open area, these old parade grounds. Uh, it has areas of disturbance uh, that could be restored, um, you know, ecological disturbance. Um, but it has, and it has some, some beach zones that people would want to visit. Um, we saw this as an area where it would still be access on a permitted or a scheduled basis, but people um, would, would be able to move around, hopefully on boardwalks or with a docent and uh, enjoy a day here. For the area to the south here, um, based on what we know about the area and are still learning, we saw this as very, very delicate. It has um, an incredible dune system, it has this large, unique freshwater wetland with remnants of Atlantic white cedars. Um, and uh, it has uh, plover nesting along the shore. So uh, we see this as an area that really should be used only by researchers and their students. And this would be, again, on a scheduled basis uh, for specific researcher educational projects. And the same thing would be true uh, for this tail end of Plum Island. Um, although some people may want to be able to look at the old gun batteries that are associated with Fort Terry and they're out here at the east end. So we thought that with the aid of a docent, there might be opportunities for people to also see parts of this, um, again, on a scheduled permitted basis. And the rest of the time it would be accessible uh, to researchers and their students. We also know that part of the Plum Island property being sold is uh, at Orient Point. That's where the, the ferry leaves to get to get the workers to and from Plum Island every day. Um, and so we started to also consider what future uses of that parcel should be. <clears throat> Basically, our vision is for Plum Island Preserve. Um, to preserve ecological value, history, cultural heritage, and preserve high quality jobs. This was important to almost all the people we spoke to in the region. There were some exceptions. Again, here's some of the artwork done by uh, Scott Blue Dorn, and he was uh, studious enough to go into the New York Natural Heritage Program's reports and look at the rare plants and then draw them, which I think it's quite, quite beautiful. Um, he's, he did this as well, based on species that were found by the Heritage Program. But we see Plum Island Preserve as an opportunity zone, uh, an opportunity for something like a new park, perhaps, um, a very limited access park, uh, an opportunity for research, and certainly an, uh, an opportunity for education. So now I'm going to go a little bit into some of what the details are on the different districts. The, the large conservation district with the three zones I pointed out, the primary purpose would be to protect biodiversity. Again, controlled public access. People want to be able to observe wildlife. People want to be able to study cultural heritage. So there may be some archeological work that could be done there that is non-invasive, like uh, sort of with ground penetrating radar, for instance. It would be a place where people can interpret history and do ecological research and uh, restore some of the areas that require it. We, we envision uh, people like this group of Long Island uh, professional geologists, um, you know, taking a chance to, to learn about this amazing place that's been undisturbed since the 1950s, where nature has rebounded. We also saw that there are some buildings at the former Fort Terry that might be in good enough shape 
to reuse. Uh, we don't have a conditions report on most of the buildings there. And by the look of them, they're in pretty rough shape. But some of them have been used, you know, maybe in the last 10 years, um, uh, like this one, that possibly could be converted into a small dormitory and a classroom that might work for a professor, for instance, to bring students over for maybe one overnight and, uh, and then do field studies during the day. Now onto the research district. Now you're looking at Plum Island heading east and this little dot out here is, uh, is Great Gull Island, Fisher's Island in the distance. But here in the foreground is what the town of Southhold envisions as the research district. And here's a nice view of the harbor. This is where the ferries uh, from uh, Old Saybrook in Connecticut and Orient Point bring workers in and out every day. About half of the, of the 400 workers at the lab are from the North Fork and Shelter Island. The others are from Connecticut. The, 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 what the, uh, the town was really hoping for is continuation of good jobs. When you consider that there are about 200 high quality research jobs or support jobs on Plum Island, um, that's hard to, to reproduce, uh, especially at the North Fork where you, know, you have mostly tourism and wine and, and uh, farming. Um, these are jobs that are, if they're not in biology or veterinary science, uh, they're um, jobs for uh, union jobs for electricians and carpenters and plumbers. So, you know, these are jobs that will be lost. We, we heard, we, we also spoke with people at the Long Island Association, which is, if you may know, is uh, Long Island's uh, largest business group. And they have a vision of a research corridor um, that would be extended to Plum Island. They already had components of it lined up, which is you know, Brookhaven National Laboratory, Stony Brook University, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, um, Northwell. Um, they, they, they envisioned it skipping to Roosevelt Island and Manhattan Island, where you have the, the Genome Institute. So they, they see this this concept of a research corridor running through Long Island for, for job growth and um, economic development. And they saw that Plum Island presented an opportunity. So the, the board of directors actually voted and for the last two years has made extending this into Plum Island a, a priority of theirs. We, we talked to as many people as we could about possible uh, jobs in or some kind of work in the research district with renewable energy or biotechnology. Um, and uh, we didn't have any takers. Uh, we're still talking to people. Um, there, there are opportunities that if we had a background in economic development ourselves, we might make more progress on. Um, but we're, we, we are still working on this and, and connecting with people who are knowledgeable. Uh, we, we see the research district as, as not just generating uh, jobs, but also hopefully um, generating enough of its own uh, funding that it can actually run the ferry that would go to and from Orient Point, because that's an expensive operation in and of itself. And so we see that that's a resource that could help with the conservation of the conservation district if they would run the ferry and also bring over visitors. And we looked at tourism as sustainable, only sustainable tourism because of the precious delicacy of the resources at Plum Island. We have heard from the uh, New London Maritime uh, Society that they would be very interested in running the, the lighthouse as a bed and breakfast, or at least um, rest help restore it and, uh, and run it as a, a visitor center and do education about lighthouses because that's one of the things they're really interested in. Um, we also see that an easement would be needed from uh, the lighthouse over to the conservation district, but all of the tourism we're looking at would be passive. 
And we see that uh, there's a number of structures on the island that could be reused, um, including the newest part of the uh, laboratory, which uh, has an administration building, an auditorium and classrooms and offices. Um, that is something that's highly convertible to other kinds of uses. We're not so sure about the giant lab spaces, which have you know, these enormous animal holding areas. Um, we don't know if they can be reused. Uh, there's also some buildings at the Plum Island Ferry Dark Dock in Orient Point. And with the zoning that the town of Southhold did pass, it would allow for a small museum there. That might be a great place for a visitor center. Um, and then of course I showed you uh, the, the potential Fort Terry structure that could be used for visitors for overnight, uh, just for, for research purposes. And, um, and then this, this uh, conceptual drawing of the kind of a lab that might take place, looking through the windows back at, at Orient Point and of course being bird friendly with frosting on them. And how do you get there? Well, part of the package are three ferries. One of them's almost brand new. It was requisitioned by the government, I'm not sure when, and it arrived about a year and a half ago. Uh, so it's a brand new ferry. Um, they are part of what Plum Island uh, is gonna be transferred with. And we do think we do know that ferries are fun, and uh, we see that this would be a good way to get people to Plum Island. But we we'll, we will need resources for it. Nice idea is that some people could come from Connecticut and walk from the Cross Sound ferry right over to the ferry to Plum Island without having to uh, add congestion to North Fork's already very congested roads. And here's a closer look at the ferry dock in Orient Point. Um, it's about nine and a half acres, and this, uh, this marina area is two and a half acres. You can see there's a lot of parking available there. Um, this is uh, the building that could be, it's an administration building now, but that could be converted into a visitor center. We would like to see access to Plum Island be sustainable. And uh, we think that this is part of that uh, concept and, and would be really beneficial, if especially, but running ferries is expensive. We also learned through this process that we went through with Marcel Day, our consultant, that uh, there's, there were two kinds of conveyances for bringing Plum Island into the hands of New York State, which was, by the way, the by far the preference of people in the region that rather than keep it in federal hands, the local people wished that the region that the regional people that we met with were saying they thought New York State would be the best recipient. And one conveyance type is a public benefit conveyance where you could get Plum Island for free, uh, potentially, or for very low cost if Plum Island were to be kept in conservation. That's um, often done with federal properties. And the other is a negotiated sale, um, which could be offered um, on, on the ferry parcel. So this was interesting, but you know we weren't quite there. Um, we were learning. We also learned that uh, we really needed to repeal, not that we didn't know it already, but we really needed to repeal that law that was requiring Plum Island to be offered to the highest bidder because these conveyance pathways were not available to us if they were gonna sell it to the likes of, of a real estate developer. Um, so that was a key issue was getting that repealed. And once we did, um, then we could see that the process could go forward to bring the outcomes we were seeking. So there was the message. We had to repeal that problem legislation. And as uh, Byron pointed out, uh, just, just uh, last December, we were able to achieve that. It might seem like two years ago, Byron, but uh, <laughs> it's just, it really was only in December of last year. It's been a long couple of years, hasn't it, people? Um, but we were very fortunate that our champions in Congress um, 
in both houses, in both the Senate and Congress all got together and said Plum Island should not be on the auction block and it should all be sold as one parcel, the ferry parcel, the island, the boats, all one package. We are incredibly grateful for this. And for all of you who wrote letters, sent postcards, made phone calls, showed up at all of our events, thank you. But now those federal conveyance options are available. And this year that uh, process is going to begin. It's complicated, it's lengthy. Uh, most of it is done by the General Services Administration, which acts like the government's realtor, um, but they have a set process and they have to begin offering the island around to other agencies first. They will be contacting the Department of Interior, for instance, and asking if they're interested in Plum Island. Uh, they'll be contacting uh, the National Park Services, which is also in the Interior Department. Um, is there a possibility that Plum Island would be or could be or should be a national monument? And if no other federal agencies want it, and they will go through all the federal agencies, not just those that I mentioned, um, then it would be offered to New York State. And so we're still working with New York to find out, you know, are they still interested? Um, would they be wanting to put Plum Island in conservation? And we have been talking with the governor's people for years on this and have access to uh, people who can really be helpful. Um, but as you all know, we just went through a pandemic where New York had to change all of its priorities. And politically, things have changed in New York in the last uh, five or six months. So um, we're hoping, we're still talking, um, but we're not positive that this is going to be an option for us. We do know, however, that the New York State's Open Space Conservation Plan that came out in 2016 named Plum Island as a place that should be acquired by the state, that the undeveloped portion of the island should be conserved for wildlife habitat, shoreline preservation and protection of significant cultural resources. It says New York State shall acquire it. So we'll see if it's available to New York, if they can do that, if they will do that. There's still a role for you. Um, we, we still think that we should be writing to our elected officials, both at the federal level and the state level. Um, I urge you to donate either to Save the Sound or the Eastern Long Island Audubon Society generously. Uh, keep all this work going. We know you do already and we appreciate it, but um, this, is the, this is the story with nonprofits to get our work advancing, as you well know. You can go to the website that belongs to preserveplumisland.org. It, it's um, the Preserve Plum Island Coalition's own website. And you will see right in the front page is a button you can push right here to ask uh, Governor Cuomo to please save Plum Island. You push this button and a letter comes up that you can alter if you wanna change the words and then click it and it goes to him. Um, there's other things you can do on the website. Um, if you go here, you'll see the Envision report and the brochure, which you can download, they're PDFs, so you can download them right to your own computer if you want to. You can see the results of the dive from 2019. Um, see all who all our other members are and so forth. So it's a, it's a nice website to check out. Also, it was recommended in uh, Envision Plum Island that we create a new 501c3 group called Friends of Plum Island and begin fundraising. Um, the coalition is just a loosely knit group of you know, 117 organizations, but we don't have a budget we don't have bylaws, we don't have a board, we have a steering committee, that's all. Um, and we don't uh, have any way to support Plum Island should it end up in conservation. We know that any federal or state agency that might be given the responsibility of taking care of Plum Island is going to need support. Friends groups are uh, the, the way this has been going now for a couple of decades where government can't do it all, Friends groups come in and help supplement with funding for things like 
security on the island, um, restoration. Uh, a 501c3 can also receive grants. And um, so things like restoration grants could be brought in um, and help the government to restore ecosystems as well as some of the, the buildings um, that are of historic nature. And, um, and, and also can support programming, uh, personnel and programming into the future. So this, these are all parts of our vision for the future of, of Plum Island. We think that Plum Island Preserve is feasible we know it has broad support. We don't know of anybody who doesn't want to preserve Plum Island. And we believe that the concept plan we've come up with does have broad support. Uh, we believe that with public ownership and friends of Plum Island, we can make it a reality. And um, we're asking you to help bring Plum Island Preserve in for a landing. Um, sorry. I. I I have one more slide I wanted to show you and my finger slipped. Um, I wanted to thank you all. Here we go. Every one of you um, and at Quag for hosting this this evening. Thank you very much. And uh, here's my contact information. I can repeat this later if you need to. And I'm open for questions if you have any. Thank you for listening. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions? And I think you can unmute yourself to ask the questions. That's fine with me. I don't know if any questions came into the chat. I don't see any, Louise. I, I do have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, the freshwater wetland. Yeah. Is there an opening to the to Plum God or to the Sound or Bay? No. No, but, there was not. But so it's interesting that you asked because um, when the scientists were there, they felt that the water was slightly brackish. Uh, the species they found in there um, seemed tolerant of, of somewhat brackish water. And so they thought that perhaps some of the larger storms might, uh, might have uh, brought in uh, uh, some kind of either inundation or just a lot of salt spray or something. Um, okay, and it's not like the uh, the coastal ponds on the south side of Long Island that open and close. No, no, yeah. but it doesn't mean that at one time it might not have been. Yeah. Um, we think geologists are interested in those stripes that are shown across across the. Um, the pond and they think they might be old dunes and that this this pond might be um, uh, remnants of an old uh, dune system as the island was accreting and sands were blowing, uh, sea level was also rising. Mm. It's interesting to think about Plum Island having a shoreline that went miles out from where it does today, um, especially to the south. Uh, it's very shallow on the south side of Plum Island and um, uh, sea level has risen significantly. So Plum Island once upon a time was a much bigger place. Okay, huh, I didn't realize that. I, I Well, the other side, the Plum Gut side, right. that's very deep. That's right here, yes. Yeah, yeah. That is very deep. Um, but it's, it's possible that um, when seas were lower, uh, that even uh, Great Gull and Little Gull and Plum Island might have been connected. And maybe even Gardner's Island too. Well, that's certainly out there and yeah. um, part of our island archipelago. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the the other the other thought that I had, you mentioned the seals and the the, the ferries that you know, may ultimately belong to whoever manages the island. Right. Um, those could be used to take people on seal watching tours when the weather cooperates. <laughs> That's right. And, and if you haven't ever been on any of the existing seal watching tours, I recommend them. They leave from Montauk in the winter. Oh, and, yes. And uh, that's Cressley, the Coastal Research okay. Education Society of Long Island, led by Artie Kopelman. Um, he, uh, it's a four hour round trip, uh, January, February, March, April, and sometimes May. Um, 
best time I found to go was February. It's the coldest, but that's when you see the most seals. Yeah. And it's a really great trip and really fascinating. And having Artie, who's an expert on marine mammals there, uh, is really educational. Right. I didn't realize that he had, he did that in the winter. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be nice, you know, it'd be another opportunity for Orient if one of the fishing vessels there, even though they're not as big as the Viking fleet, if much closer, it wouldn't be a four hour trip in the dead of winter across some cold water. Right. But uh, there's, some, there's lots of possibilities. It, it's interesting to think about it. It is. Uh, we, we have great hopes. And we've been um, having discussions this spring with a number of national organizations that have experience in putting uh, land like Plum Island into conservation status. Uh, mm. For instance, the um, National Wildlife Refuge Association, um, the, uh, the people at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation work closely with Congress. They've been giving us some advice. Um, and uh, the, the Wilderness Society, uh, we've spoken to people there who have expertise in creating wildlife refuges as well as uh, national monuments. We also learned that a national monument can be focused on um, whatever quote unquote objects um, are of interest. Now, we don't think of animals and plants as objects among ourselves, but um, it would all be in what the proclamation for the national monument stated would be the focal point for the national monument. So it isn't always just historic resources. It can be natural resources. There are national natural monuments. Mm. So uh, that's one of the options we're, we're also looking at right now. And um, we are talking to our senators and um, in Connecticut and New York who are still highly interested in preserving Plum Island and doing what they can to help us. Good. A um, couple of people have commented in the chat. Uh, Pat Aiken uh, said it was a great presentation and thank you for all the work. Uh, Susie Stewart the same way. Um, Laura Brennan, um, my sentiments, she, she applauds what you did. Uh, Pat also um, mentioned, and I think we would support this wholeheartedly, it would be wonderful to have tours of the island centered around the ecology, geology, um, bird life. Uh, it's something that we have tried to do is get out there for field trips. Uh, it's difficult at this point, um, but to have something that is not unspoiled, but has not been developed uh, would be a right. great opportunity to go look at birds and animals uh, at different times of the year. Right. I think that's a, you know, that's a future use that we would certainly support of the facility. Right. And, th and this was, this is what we heard loud and clear. And we also heard that people would want them to be guided and uh, with careful treading um, to make sure that nothing was disturbed. We don't want to love a place to death. Uh, it is only 800 and somewhere between 822 and 840 acres. It is delicate. Um, it does need restoration in some areas, but think of an, one more place that's been left basically alone other than the lab uh, for, uh, since 1954 in, right. in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, you, you really can't, you can't, maybe Gardner's Island, but it is private, you know, right, and, right. and they've, they've altered Gardner's Island quite a bit over the years with hunting and different kinds of activities there. So uh, the tours uh, were in place until 2018. And then the Department of Homeland Security, which manages and owns the island, um, cut them off. We did hear good news that tomorrow, New York State officials are going to go to Plum Island, they're getting their own visit tomorrow. Oh, wow. People from New York State Parks. Um, so I'm really happy to hear that. I can't wait to hear what they say about it. Um, and, uh, and we think that they're opening tours for other officials right now, but I don't believe they're open yet again for the general public. Right. And it was, it was a lengthy process um, you know, with the Homeland Security issues and the likes to get onto the island for, it for is. tours. And it, and it always will be because yeah. they have their concerns. You have to get, um, you know, clearance. So, um, you know, that's how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Okay, other questions or thoughts from people? Oh, come on, folks, you must have something. <laughs> it's all right. I, I said a lot. Maybe I said too much. No, you know, this was, this was good, Louisa. It was a very good, very good update of what's going on. I think it's, in, I think it's encouraging. Uh, I've sat in on some of the workshops. Yes, you did. Um, and, you know, that was, that was rewarding. And I think what we can do, and you made the point at the end, we need to exercise our power of the pen and reach out to our legislators and governor and the folks that make the decisions and let them know how we feel. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, there, there's real power in numbers. Um, we, we've, we heard, uh, okay, I guess there's a, I wish I could remember it, Bird Conservation Society. Does that sound familiar? Uh, it's on a national uh, bird conservation organization that was alerted by a uh, national Audubon. Um, and they sent out uh, alerts uh, um, a year and a half or two ago. And it really had a big effect on, uh, on our Congress people. Mm. We heard okay. from uh, Congressman Lee Zeldin that uh, his office was besieged with emails that came in from that organization's uh, membership. So, you know, it really, not that he wasn't trying already to do something for Plum Island, but um, he, he has remarked several times on the power of uh, that many people contacting legislators. And on another occasion, we heard from one of our big supporters in the Senate who basically asked was begging off and saying, okay, 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 we're get, we get it. You know, we've gotten so many e emails from you. We can't even do our work. So you've got to stop <laughs> the emails. <laughs> of course, we didn't stop the emails, but um, no, no. But this, is, this is how you <laughs> get things done. So uh, definitely, if you don't mind, go to preserveplumisland.org and uh, click that button and send things into Governor Cuomo. Yes. Really be helpful. Yep. Okay, um, everybody liked your presentation. All the comments are that way. Um, again, one presentation was yeah. presentation was really thorough and really good. I love that artwork and your thoroughness, Louise. You really mastered the Plum Island. <laughs> Thank you. We need to support you. Thank you. Thank you, and your own organization as we work together. Yeah, I think we as a chapter have been involved since pretty early on with yes. this process. You have. Uh, and, and as others, we're not the only chapter. Uh, North Fork and I think some of the others, I'm not sure who else, but North Fork and Eastern Long Island certainly have been. Right. So you will see if you go to the members page of our website, you can see all of the logos and names of the organizations involved. And and yes, Byron, uh, this, this chapter has, you've had me at the refuge a few years ago to do a presentation in person. And you did participate as well as did Pat in, uh, in some of the rest of you, I think, um, in the Envision Plum Island process. So mm -hmm. it's great. No, it, so. it's good, it's good. We're glad to have folks like you that can, can lead the charge, you know? It's... <laughs> Well, I, I, I said, hey, I live in Southold. I can help. And this is, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's sort of evolved. <laughs> yes, that's the problem with saying yes to something. <laughs> I'm happy to. Uh, this, is yeah. a, this is a great thing to have passion over. So, okay. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And if you'd like me to sign off now. Um, I, um, I, think, I think we're good to go. Any other questions? One last shot. Um, okay. Thank you, Virginia. Victoria, Victoria Cousins. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I want to thank you for all the people here that participated this evening. Great presentation. And we'll try to have you back when there's more to report. All right. Okay. Um, is there anything else from anybody that we need to discuss this evening? Hearing nothing, seeing nothing. I hope everybody um, has a great evening. Louise, this is Susie Stewart. I just wanted to say thank you. Well, it was a great presentation. The, the pictures were wonderful. And I 
would love to go there. <laughs> it just looks like the coolest place to go birding and, and yeah. exploring. And but then you we got to be careful and not over explore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you. And thank we'll be talking Sarah, to you again soon. Susie. Thank you, Byron. Yes. You're welcome. All right. All right. Everyone have a good evening. Stay safe and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.